let us all just quieten down our thoughts. We have all come from different parts of the estate, having a lot of different stories going on in our minds. Let's just quieten down for a moment. Just take a couple of deep breaths and quieten ourselves. Please recite after me. If you can kindly stand up, we'll say the universal prayer. O hidden life, vibrant in every atom, O hidden light shining in every creature, O hidden love embracing all in oneness, may all who feel themselves as one with thee know they are therefore one with every other. Thank you. Sisters and brothers, I have today the great pleasure of introducing to you all an amazing personality. When I first met Tim Boyd here at Adyar at the 2011 convention, straight away we struck a common chord. And the note was attention to detail. We spent some time talking about the estate and I knew that soon, in time to come, we'll be working together on a number of things. So here we are. Born in New York, Mr. Tim Boyd is an honors graduate with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Public Affairs. He joined the Theosophical Society in the year 1974 and so that means next year he completes 50 years of his membership in the Theosophical Society. Right from a very young age Tim Boyd has always shown exceptional organizational and leadership qualities. In 2007, he became the president of the Theosophical Order of Service in America. And in 2011, he was elected the president of the Theosophical Society in America. It was his presidency it was during this time that the Theosophical Society in America sponsored Dalai Lama to visit Chicago in July 2011. It was a two-day event attended by 10,000 people. The event was so hugely successful, mainly due to Tim's logistical mastery and ability to handle any last minute issues that can ar arise from such a high level visit. After his successful handling of the Dalai Lama's visit, it was no wonder that in April 2014, Mr. Tim Boyd 
was elected as the eighth international president of the Theosophical Society. Having very successfully completing, completed his first seven year term, he was once and again elected unopposed to his second seven year term in 2021. It has been under his leadership that the great educational product, project here at Adyar under the name of Adyar Theosophical Academy has been started and the Besson Memorial Animal Dispensary has taken a new phase has been expanded to become one of the leading dispensary for animals in Chennai. In the last eight years of his presidency, Tim Boyd has visited so many countries of the world, giving talks, lectures, conducting workshops, seminars, interviews, etc. That if I start listing the number of countries, it will take a long time. However, friends, it is a coincidence that he has visited all the countries of this interconnected world except Africa. <laughs> I know he is a very busy person, but today I have managed to twist his arm and he has promised to visit Africa in the very near future. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our international president, Mr. Tim Boyd, to give the fifth public lecture of this convention entitled, The Choice to be Whole. Brother Tim Boyd. All right, thank you very, very much for the introduction, Narendra. I, uh, for a while there, I was going along thinking like, this is a really, really great person to have introducing me, right up until that little sneaky piece at the end. So uh, you shouldn't do that in front of hundreds of people. But uh, I don't think I need to tell you how happy I am to be here once again and to have the opportunity to share just a few moments and to share some thoughts, and hopefully in the sharing process we'll be sharing something more than just thoughts. That's always the hope. Uh, I should say I have been very appreciative on a couple of the evenings that we have been here when mention was made at the very beginning about the roots that we all stem from. You know, in many traditions, there is the idea of uh, guru devotion and guru recognition. And, you know, just to think that what has put us in these seats here together is something that certainly goes back beyond our time and is something that is more uh, potent than our own individual thoughts and will. We have at the root of this gathering together, outwardly certainly the great beings of H.P. Blavatsky. We had Colonel Alcott who tirelessly worked on behalf of this organization to establish it. Behind them is the lineage of those great beings of Mahatmas who saw a need in the world and through their vision of that need has called us all together to be here at this moment. So that's something that is always worth remembering. It never does hurt. So today I'm here to talk to you and I wanna to talk just about a couple of things really. 
Uh, basically, what I want to talk about is choice and wholeness. And you can't talk about wholeness without talking about fragmentation. But very recently, I found myself in a conversation with someone, highly educated person, very accomplished as well. And as they were talking, they were talking about how our lives are controlled by our genetics. It was an interesting thing for someone to say, and I had hoped we could follow up on it. And so we did. So the idea that lurking in our genes are all sorts of things, you know, cancers, diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, and that these are things that really, in many ways, dictate the course and the direction of our lives. And it was a fascinating thing to hear, and I found myself just asking, do you really believe that? And the comment was yes. Although we didn't pursue it much further, my response was, well, if that is the case, then you should probably hope that there's nothing lurking in your genetics, if this is in fact what controls our uh, lives and our existence. Obviously, this is something that uh, I don't ascribe to, and I assume that others do not as well. One of the reasons that the Theosophical Society came into existence, according to me, has been to plant certain very powerful seeds in the consciousness of humanity. Seeds that have been very necessary, that needed to grow, needed to spread, needed to take life in the human family. So powerful ideas, you know, ideas like the unity of all life. Ideas like the multi-dimensional nature of reality and of ourselves. Not just the universe is multidimensional, we are. The idea that there is no such thing as empty space. You know, sometimes I think of that as a statement of omnipresent intelligence, that from moment to moment we dwell within not only forms of consciousness that surround us, that touch us when we are available, but a greater consciousness, a greater whole within whose body we participate. The biblical statement is we live, move, and have our being within that greater whole. But this is an idea that, uh, again, according to me, this was one of the things that this theosophical movement came into being to plant in the minds of humanity. Spiritual evolution, another idea absent, but now present because of the work of uh, pioneering minds and because of the work that you and I have done. But today, really one of those key seeds and important items that I'd like for us to go into is this idea of self-responsibility in the three truths that uh, those three statements that come at the end of that little book, little story book, and an excellent one, The Idol of the White Lotus, these three truths are enumerated, of which the last of those is this idea of self-responsibility. The statement being a very strong one that each person, in there it says each man, but each man is his own absolute lawgiver. It's a strong statement. Each man is his own absolute lawgiver, the dispenser of glory or gloom to himself, the decreer of his life, his reward, and his punishment. So the idea of self Responsibility, that it is not something that is up to any unseen beings. 
It's not something that finds us at the mercy of powers beyond ourselves, but each one of us, if this statement rings true, has a certain responsibility for our self-unfoldment and our self-awareness. Now, clearly an objection to that sort of view would be that we really don't have control over many of the circumstances in our lives. I mean, people do, in fact, get cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure. People find themselves all the time, the way that we as a humanity conduct ourselves, all the time people are being engulfed in wars of various types. At the moment, we focus mostly on Ukraine and Russia, but there are 40 other wars going on in the world as we sit here now. So you know, the circumstances in which we find ourselves clearly are not things that are necessarily under our control. So where does this idea of absolute lawgiver come in in that setting? There was a man in, during World War II Actually, he went on to write a book. He was a psychiatrist in Austria. He was a Jewish psychiatrist in Austria. So he was swept up and put in, he and his family were put into concentration camps uh, during the war. His name was Viktor Frankl. Uh, he had been doing a great deal of research. He was a psychiatrist and he had a theory that he was trying to flesh out Actually, when they swept him up to take him to the uh, concentration camp, the one thing that he brought with him was his thesis, the work that he had been working so hard on preparing. He brought it with him. Of course, when they arrived, everything that they had was taken from him. And the next three years, he spent in concentration camps with all that that meant. Uh, a witness to this atmosphere and this climate and this lowest of all positions that a person can be put into. But he developed in part out of that. After the war, he wrote a book. To many people, they regard it as the greatest book written during the 20th century. That's saying a lot, even if you don't believe that's true. But it's a great book, and it's a short book. And it's called Man's Search for Meaning. But out of it, he distilled his ideas about choice, really, and tested it in the climate of the uh, concentration camp, uh, where many of the people, he says, the best among them didn't make it through, for whatever reason he did. But he had the idea that really the most important thing that we have in our lives is a sense of meaning. And he designated three specific areas from which meaning derives. And, you know, you listen to it and you decide for yourself if it's something that has some accuracy. The first one he talked about was purposeful work. You know, the work we do the jobs we have, the fact that we feel as if we're plugged into something gives us a sense of meaning. I know many people who, on losing a job, somehow lose direction. Something about their purpose for being here has been taken away. So that's the first one he talks about. Second one he talks about is relationships and love is one of the powerful sources of meaning for all of us. And I think we all know that that's true. I can remember, uh, well, probably it was about 25, maybe even 30 years ago, my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. At that time, my father was alive. And so we were in the hospital, and my father was keeping a strong face. But uh, came the time when my mother was taken away for the surgery that had to be done. And my father turned to me, he said, son, if anything happens to your mother, 
He says, I am gone. <laughs> that, she's 104 now, I should say, so it's not a sad story at all. She just celebrated her 104th birthday month before last. But the idea that the importance, the meaning-providing importance of others, loved ones, was the second great source of meaning he identified. But then the third, and one that I think is very important because it's specifically applied to his situation there in the concentration camps in Germany. The third one that he talked about was one's attitude in the face of suffering. The point he made was that everything can be taken away from someone except one thing. And that one thing is to choose our attitude in the face of any sorts of conditions. We have that choice. Obviously, every one of us faces challenges during the course of our life. But this idea of each person is their own absolute lawgiver goes toward this aspect of choice. That ultimately, no matter how dark it may seem, no matter how difficult it may be, choice remains. I have known many people who have been in prison, which is one of those ne very negative environments, who have, even in that environment, developed the capacity to help others, to have a compassionate outlook toward others, and to do great work in a setting that is most difficult because of a choice. So choice is an important aspect of uh, who and what we are. Also, it's an important aspect of this theosophical movement. Self-responsibility is something that places the conditions that we generate into our own hands. It's something that takes it out of the hands of the priest, of the politician, whoever it may be. Self-choice. So, maybe a little bit needs to be said also about this whole idea of wholeness. You know, what is it that we're talking about when we talk about the choice which we have to be whole? From a, the perspective of the ageless wisdom, there is this idea that there is a universal consciousness. That in the case of the human being, it is something that becomes progressively shrouded. You know, from one layer to another, we think in terms of atma, buddhi, manas, and downward, that this consciousness becomes progressively shrouded, progressively filtered, until we get to the point that we sit here now with each other, firmly convinced of our separation and our individuality, convinced for a very good reason, uh, largely for the fact that everything that we do confirms it. If I'm not mistaken, it was on this stage that I remember hearing Radha Bernier make a statement about this. And what she had to say was that we all know that we are separate from one another because if I tell my hand to move, Nothing happens with yours. You know, everything we do confirms that, you know, yes, it's true that we're separate. And so there is this uh, powerful thought that we have become involved in. We have become, in the words of uh, Pradeep Gohil the other night when he talked about the, the factors that uh, convince us that we are fragmented. You know, each one of us here comes from a different country, from a different community. We are divided into genders. You know, all of those different things are aspects that we have learned to cling to, have learned to express through, and claim to be 
our own. You know, it's, the, it's the problem of identity. Uh, we have this universal consciousness that is a root identity, but we find ourselves separated from it. In this journey that we have undertaken, H.P. Uh, Blavatsky spoke of it as the pilgrimage of necessity, there's this idea that there is an outgoing path, you know, and on that path we find ourselves moving ever more deeply and deeply into our association with matter, ever more deeply convinced of the reality of a material way of living, a material consciousness. That's the pattern that we undergo. There are a number of beautiful stories that speak to this in the religious scriptures of the world. One of my particular favorites is the story of the prodigal son. You know, the story of the son who has everything living in the father's house but wants to go out and make his own way. It's the story of the soul. The son who leaves the house of the father and goes to a very, very far land, and along the way, drops, squanders all of his wealth. And it's the story of us. We leave the house of an undivided consciousness, not by choice, it is the pilgrimage of necessity. And we wander, and we find ourselves ultimately far, far away from that undivided state that uh, is a home to us. We feel as if we're far away, even though always it's very present. That particular story I always like because there comes a moment that, at least for me, is the most important moment in the story, which is when the son who has wandered so far has a waking up moment. In that particular story, he's wandered so very far that he is now doing the lowest sort of employment that you could have done in that time. He's having to feed the swine. And not only is he having to feed the swine, but to complicate matters, now there's a famine in the land. And it's said that he becomes so hungry that he would eat the food that he was feeding to the swine. So it's really just a description of us. You know, we are here, we are in material bodies, we are eating of a material food, and we are feeling ourselves as separated. But there comes a moment when we awaken, and this really is the most important part of all of this. We can awaken, and when we awaken, then what was once an outgoing journey becomes a journey back home. And the Nivriti Marga, the incoming journey, we can begin. And so this is one of the, uh, one of the features of this process of fragmentation. Not only are we self-divided along lines of nationality, we've managed somehow to alienate ourselves from the natural world. A lot of what has been talked about here has related to that. Uh, it is, in fact, an urban planet that we are living on in the year 2023. More people live in cities than live in rural settings, and we have become quite cut off from the natural world, and that has effects. There was a story, there was a uh, study that was done at the University of Michigan. It's been some years ago. It got a lot of attention, I think because of the catchy title. The title for the study was How the City Hurts Your Brain. <laughs> How the City Hurts your brain. And basically the study, in a way it confirmed things that we probably already know. 
the way the study was set up, they had a number of psychological and just other sorts of tests that they would do. Two groups. One group, they said, well, let's take a break and then we can come back and continue the testing. That group, they said, look, take a walk down Main Street. So they had to walk with the stoplights, the city buses, everything that they were encountering. Another group, they said, you take a walk in the park over here. So they walked in the park. When they came back to do the testing, they found that the cognitive abilities of the city people, city walkers, had diminished substantially. That their impulse, ability to resist impulse, had gone down. The other ones came back. They tested better than they ever did before. They found that for people living in cities, even something as simple as having a view out your window of a tree affected the level of domestic violence in various apartments in a building. The fact that nature is healing Nature is restorative, and perhaps the cities are less so, was one of the things that was confirmed in this particular study. So alienation from nature, nature such as this place we all know, it has very stable patterns. We can feel it from time to time as inhabited by greater intelligences. I can remember a number of years ago, uh, a group of us from the Theosophical Society in America, we went on a tour to Tibet. And one of the ideas that was quite prevalent there was that on the mountaintops, mountaintops were special because they were inhabited by great beings. And any time you would be driving over one of the mountaintops, there would be prayer flags everywhere. And you, know, you would be encouraged to greet the beings of the mountain. They were described as the Laz. And so every time we'd come over the top of a mountain ridge, it would be, we would all shout out, Kiki so so Lajolo. Basically just means happiness, happiness, blessings, blessings from the Laz, the devas of the mountain. But this idea that nature is inhabited is something that is prevalent throughout the world, and it is restorative. And we have managed somehow to cut ourselves off from that experience is another factor that has caused some fragmentation. You know, so for us, you know, we are told that at a certain point, we have the capacity to take these matters into our own hands. In the words of uh, the prop three propositions to the secret doctrine, she talks about moving from a point of natural impulse to self-induced and self-devised effort. Each of us can choose to facilitate our own unfoldment, our own growth. And that in making that choice, we find that it has effects. The other night we had uh, Dr. James Tepfer, who was here and he was speaking with us. His talk was about three great people, and he talked about, at that time, human magic was the way that he described it, which is basically the idea that these people Three people, the ones he chose were Lincoln, uh, Eisenhower, and Nelson Mandela, yes. That these are people whose consciousness was such that it exuded something that affected their environment, affected the people around them. And he described it as human magic. And this is something that I think we all are aware of. I mean, we've all had that experience of being in the presence of a cheerful person and feeling uplifted, being in the presence of someone who is depressed and feeling, if we're not careful, depressed ourselves. 
I did not know personally, I never met Sri Ram, the former president of the Theosophical Society here. But I've met a lot of people who knew him and tell stories about the nature and the quality of the man. One of the stories that I particularly like is how he was a very quiet man. And as is always the case anywhere where there are people, from time to time, interpersonal problems arise. And how people would come to him to seek out his advice on how to deal with these things. And I've heard stories more than once of people who would come to him, they would sit down for his advice, they would talk, describe their problem, and after a while when the appointment would end, they would walk away and they would comment to themselves how really good they now feel and how his advice and his input was so good. And then when they would try to think about what he had said, they would realize he, had been, he hadn't said anything or almost nothing. But that being in the presence of someone who was attuned was this sort of magical aspect that it influenced them to be peaceful. And this is something, you know, just for myself, I've had numerous experiences of this type. I, in fact, when the Dalai Lama was in Chicago, I was only with him for, at that point, uh, three days. And every day there was something new that you might say is uh, out of the ordinary that would happen. You know, people would meet him for the first time and burst into tears, or people would meet him and then later you'd hear they had spontaneous healings of different things, those sorts of things. But I can remember on one occasion, um, I had gone to a conference. It was called the Soul of Service. And it was a conference of service organizations with a spiritual focus. And the group that called it together was called the Human Service Alliance. Really powerful people in the field of service came together in Winston-Salem, North Carolina for this meeting. And some of the more prominent ones gave talks and we listened. But I remember there was one woman. She was a doctor. And she was responsible for initiating the structure for hospice, end-of-life care in the United States. It was something that was not accepted with people's insurance. It was something that maybe you could get if you knew a church group, but it wasn't something that was standardized in any way or available universally. But she was the one who was responsible for making that happen. She was a doctor. She was not involved in the political world at all, but her value of this hospice movement ended up putting her there. But when she talked, she didn't talk about politics. You know, she told a few stories about how things happened. But she talked about her approach. And her approach was, she was a person who described herself as a person who was prayerful. She believed in the power of prayer. And she had this particular prayer she said she would always say, which when she was working with her patients as a doctor, which was, Lord, put your hand in my hand so that when I touch others, it may be your hand that touches them. Very nice, very nice words. And she was true to that approach. But I remember this. This was a very busy conference, much like what we have here. But they had set aside a room, little room, for, and they called it a meditation room. They put plants in it. They had water trickling, so you had like a very comfortable sound. It was a little bit darkened. And at one point during the course of all of the busyness of this conference, I 
felt I needed to just check into this room just so I could sit down and just relax for a moment. When I walked in, the room was empty except for this lady. I went over someplace else and sat down. And I never will forget, I mean, I sat down really with the intention just to breathe and relax. But the next thing I knew, I had this experience, this most exalted sort of experience that came over me very, very quickly. You know, hardly had I sat and closed my eyes before I found myself transported into this very deep stillness. And so anyway, sat in that, and then when I got up, I got up and left after however long it was. So anyway, the conference comes to an end. And at that point, time to say goodbye, and I asked the doctor if I could uh, take a photo of her. And she said, no, Tim, you come over here and take a, I want you to take a picture with me. The day before, she had taken me and insisted that I travel with her as she talked to different doctors' groups and nurses' groups. I knew nothing about that. But she made a point of it to take me to each one, and they would ask her questions. And then she turned to me and said, what do you think, Tim? I, I didn't have any idea what to say, but she wanted to have me near. But anyway, I said, can I take a picture? She said, here, come on over. Take a picture next to me. And so she turned to me at that moment and she said, Tim, when we were in that meditation room, she said, I was praying for you. She said, did you feel it? And it was only then that I realized the nature of this particular experience. So the idea being that for each one of us, there is this potential for this human magic. I do like the term that uh, James Tepper used. And that from time to time, we experience it with others. It is magnified when we find it within us to commit to that. Albert Schweitzer, the great Nobel laureate, made the statement, Somebody asked him, you know, what, what will be our destiny? He said, I don't know what your destiny will be. But I do know this. Only those among you who have sought and found how to serve will be truly happy. And that this aspect of seeking, of serving, of unfolding through self-induced, self-devised efforts opens within us powers that are asleep. They're latent. You know, we admire the many people that we know of who are healers, who are clairvoyants, who are great speakers of truth. But all of these things are powers that, if what they tell us are true, then they're resident in each and every one of us. So, I mean, that's something that is demonstrated to us again and again. The other night we had a very, uh, what I thought was a really uh, a difficult subject and a brilliant, uh, brilliant way of addressing it when we had our Theosophy Science Lecture with Dr. Manu Jaiswal. It's a difficult topic to take up, how science, how far can we go? And I do believe that as people who are involved in a spiritual approach, that sometimes we feel ourselves, if not at odds with science, minimally somewhat intimidated by the force and the power of scientific uh, theory and revelations. But the very first slide that he showed, I think, is the basis for what is a spiritual approach as well as a scientific approach. What he showed initially was a view of the scientific method. 
Science as we have come to know it has developed according to the uh, people who have practiced it. But the scientific method is something that uh, applies throughout. Basically, what he said at the start is that in any scientific method, there's a theory, but that everything is driven by what can be observed. Empirical data is what he pointed toward. What we can observe from experimentation or from life in general. And that if the data, if the data does not support the theory, the theory is either thrown out or refined or it's confirmed. The difficulty that we have had is that when we think in terms of the scientific approach, very many people speak about how it has reduced reality. It has reduced it to the physical realm. It has reduced it to the realm of five senses. And that becomes a problem. In the world of the spiritual, scientific language has been what has been applied forever. I mean, you take His Holiness the Dalai Lama. He's very fond of saying that each one of us has the greatest laboratory, better than any laboratory you'll find at India Institute of Technology or Harvard University. And that's our own consciousness. H.P. Blavatsky, when describing what is theosophy, one of the things she said that theosophy is the accumulated wisdom of the ages, tested and verified by generations of seers. This is pure scientific language. It's tested, it's verified, but the difference is that the science that we know today is based on five senses. And those five senses can only confirm or deny physical reality. But the science of the ageless wisdom was brilliant in that it included a sixth sense, not just the yanandrias that we know of the ear, the nose, the tongue, the hand, the eyes, the five senses. They added the sense of the mind, the sense of the human consciousness, as this sixth sense. And based on that, the capacity for experimentation increases enormously. I mean, you see this in, in Tibetan Buddhism, they have the bhava chakra, which is a 12-segmented wheel, which depicts the 12 nidanas, or the 12... Uh, interdependent links of origination. But one of those is the six senses, and it's depicted as a house with six windows. Taste, touch, smell, sight, sound, and mind. And based on the scientific approach, I mean, each one of us is a practicing scientist to the extent that we realize it and accept it. And there are great theories that have been put forward. Take one, uh, the Buddha. The very first words of the Dhammapada, first verse, states a theory that can be proven or not. He says that all that we are is the result of our thoughts. That's the theory. All that we are is the result of our thoughts. It is founded on our thoughts. It is made up of our thoughts. So these thoughts are substantial in this particular scientific view. The next part of that same verse outlines an experiment for us to undertake. 
The experiment being, if a man, if a person, speaks or acts with an evil thought, sorrow follows him like the wheel follows the foot of the bull that draws the cart. So that's something we can experiment with. To the extent that we have these angry, evil, unkind thoughts, is this something that is provable? If it is, then the greater theory can be accepted. If it's not, then it doesn't have to be. The other scientific aspect that he emphasizes is the idea that if a person speaks or acts with a good thought, then happiness follows, like a never-departing shadow is the way that he put it. So a shadow that is constantly with you, if that's the results of the good thought. And these things are testable if we are willing to do it. It involves a different sort of... Uh, Science, it's the science of the intuition and of the mind, but science nonetheless. So these are just some ideas. Choice, wholeness, our responsibility to experiment and to find truth for ourselves. These are all things that are involved in this. Ultimately, we do have a responsibility. If we had to name it, the responsibility might be called something like, we are responsible to know and to know deeply. And the knowledge, of course, is of a slightly different type. The great prophet who is beloved by both Islam, Hindus, and Sikhs, Kabir, one occasion he made the, he wrote the statement that what, only what I have, only what Kabir has lived through. If I haven't lived through a thing, it's not true. Only what, what Kabir says is what he has lived through. If you have not lived through a thing, then it is not true. We are very easy to quote the truths and the expressions of others. But until it becomes something that is our own personal experience, then is it true? We have a responsibility to know. And we have a responsibility to ignite, to catch fire. You know, each one of us, if you have any association with these truth teachings, the idea is that we bring ourselves ever closer to those teachings. We warm ourselves at the hearth of these teachings. And ultimately, we commit and we are able to become inflamed by them. This is the way that, uh, the only way that the world changes. In terms of our responsibility, we have heard about our interconnections. That's clear. We have heard about the various ways we are responsible. The only thing left for us is to live these things, to catch fire, to commit. And with that, we have something of a hope for our shared future. So with that, I thank you all. We have had a time together. Very often we come to these sorts of events with the idea that we're going to meet others and thinking perhaps about what it is we might gain from such events. 
I do believe that probably one of the great things we gain is from those moments when there is a harmony that we experience together. Because in that process, we gain the opportunity to be of use to those great ones who can work through a harmonious body and that their blessing can go out into the world in ways that we don't know and in ways that we don't need to know. So thank you. Thank you, one and all. After that truly beautiful talk, there is no need to say any more. So I'll ask Shaker to take over.